This is a potato, one of the world's tastiest foods and crappiest batteries. We've all seen the science experiments. Look at this potato clock or this potato light. There are a lot of clocks and lights and really almost nothing else. You see, although potatoes have a basic chemical makeup that functions like the juicy filling of a real battery, unfortunately, it's far, far less potent than the chemicals you find in real batteries. So yes, sticking an anode and a cathode into a potato can harness a tiny amount of electrical power but usually only enough to power something, well, weak. But while clocks and LEDs don't require much electricity, generating heat, especially enough to cook something, requires a lot. There was this art science project in Sweden a few years ago where a famous cyclist tried to toast a piece of bread with pedal power. And even though this dude had legs like tree trunks, the experience left him exhausted on the floor in pain. That was just to toast a piece of bread in a toaster for a few minutes. Now imagine what it would take to bake a potato in an oven for an hour. But that's exactly what I want to find out. Can you cook a potato using the world's weakest battery, the potato? Now the reason that I want to try this impossible task is because at its core, the potato is an underdog and starch. We all know what it's like to be bad at something. My phone is a potato. And even though we do call things a potato when they underperform, I'm a potato. We say it with love because we know that potatoes need a massive investment of energy, in this case heat, to reach their delicious potential. That's why there's something poetic about the idea of the weakest part of the potato helping it to achieve its greatest strength. And we just might be able to do it with the help of a brilliant material called aerogel. You've probably heard of the guy who cooked a chicken by slapping it, Lewis Weiss, but you might not know that he was only able to do it by using a hyperinsulating material called aerogel to trap the tiny amount of heat from each slap. Aerogel is so good at trapping heat that if we wrapped a tiny potato-sized oven with it, it just might be efficient enough to run off of a potato battery. It also just so happens that Lewis invited me to a special Thanksgiving called Slapsgiving, where I will be tasting turkey that was cooked by slapping it. And Lewis wanted me to bring a uniquely cooked dish to share. But with Slapsgiving quickly approaching and no guarantee this will work, I've got a lot of work to do. And though I'm confident I can make a super insulated oven, I'm much less certain about the potato battery. So I decided to reach out to Basically Homeless because Nick had built a potato powered computer. Two main things stood out from our conversation. One was that I needed large sheets of anode and cathode material to maximize the surface area. And the second was, I'm pretty sure you can use powdered potatoes. You just add water. I thought of that like eight months later, like a year later, man. If I would have just used powdered potatoes, hours and hours and days and smells. Boxed potatoes sounded much better than boil them, mash them, stick them in a battery. And I definitely needed to rework the layout if I was gonna bring this to a party. So I designed a modular cell out of foamular board, which looks like a shallow rectangular swimming pool. The bottom is lined with a zinc sheet. The middle is filled with potatoes, then it's covered by a copper sheet. The foam reservoir contains the potatoes and any water that might separate out. Additionally, you can stack the cells on top of each other, which not only saves space, but also squishes the zinc and copper sandwiches slightly together, ensuring ideal surface contact. This design is able to contain 50 square feet of copper and 50 square feet of zinc, yet only take up as much space as a small bench. Now the oven design needs to make the most out of whatever power that these batteries produce. And the core of the oven is a container. Your oven at home has a lot of space inside and a thin layer of insulation on the outside, and we need the opposite. Our chamber should be just barely larger than a potato, with as much insulation on the outside as possible. I started with an aluminum tube, but ultimately switched to a glass jar. Not only would the glass be easy to clean and temperature safe, but a stainless lid would help keep the oven area separate from the insulation and make the ideal mounting point for a heating element and temperature probe. Each layer of aerogel was held on by a layer of high temp polyamide tape, with the final layer sealing tightly against the jar neck trapping the nasty powder inside. Seriously, this stuff is the texture equivalent of nails on a chalkboard. The quadruple wrapped chamber and triple wrapped lid cover fit snugly inside a machined polystyrene oven case. In the search for greater efficiency, I tried putting the whole thing inside of a vacuum walled chamber, but eventually I just went for even more foam. The oven is now perfectly suited for many low power sources and shouldn't need any more improvements, unless the potato battery has some sort of 
issue. It just starts plummeting. We started kind of high. Why does it drop so rapidly? It was really hard to get consistent readings from a potato cell, as it would drop voltage and amperage steadily while running. The cell could also fluctuate greatly based on how much pressure was put on the top. The peak levels would be just fine for running the oven, but how low would it get and how long would that take? Each test was a messy, time-consuming ordeal that left me with more questions than answers. I tried to prepare for the worst by running many hours of tests of the oven at various simulated potato power levels, but I was getting worried. At this point in the process, I really don't know that this is gonna work. I don't have enough electricity. These batteries lose power so fast. It takes forever to test an oven because it takes forever to get up to temperature. And I haven't even experimented with different heating elements. And I don't have time. Slapsgiving is coming up and I need to have this thing ready to go. I even tried to increase the surface area of the batteries by exposing both sides of the copper and zinc to potatoes with the use of plastic grids to ensure even spacing and prevent short circuiting, but I found no perceivable difference. Since I couldn't easily improve the batteries, I decided to throw everything I had at the oven. I switched to a much smaller jar with a much smaller potato and much more aerogel. This thing was so insanely efficient, but would that be enough? I was done theorizing. If this challenge was gonna crush me, it would be under the weight of a couple hundred pounds of mashed potatoes. The potato was prepared. The oven was loaded. The mash was mixed. The cells were stacked. Oh my God. And the wiring complete. Holy moly. That's a lot of amps. All right, we're not gonna waste any of that power. Get this plugged in right now. All I could do now Let's turn it on. I'm gonna do it, I'm hooking it up. Give the power. You've gotta see how I saved Slapsgiving. But in this moment, I failed. The battery wattage dropped like a rock the moment it was connected. And after an hour, it had only raised the oven temperature by a few degrees. An external test heating element only increased by about 10 degrees under potato power. Yeah, like I needed a battery 10 times the size of this one, as it looks like, to maybe cook a tiny potato. This has kicked my ass. I must have been using the meter incorrectly because even a single AA battery was able to heat the oven better than this 14 cell goopy monstrosity. You are ridiculous, potato battery. A part of me was actually relieved that I was so very far off the mark. There was no way I could spend thousands of dollars on materials, work countless more hours, and waste thousands of pounds of potatoes just to maybe make this work. And with that painful acceptance came a realization. I can't afford to build such an enormous potato battery, and especially not in time for Slapsgiving. But what if I could simulate the power of one? And what if I could do it in a way that you would never think would work? Because I kind of told you it wouldn't work at the beginning of this video. Trying to pedal 700 watts of power for even a couple minutes is ridiculous. But what if you only had to produce 1% of that? Could you do that long enough to bake a potato? Excited at the idea, I grabbed a Power Wheels motor from the land speeder and rigged up a hand crank generator to do a quick test. I knew that the events of the next few seconds would be critical. If I didn't see meaningful temperature change, then this too might be a lost cause. But I was amazed that in just 40 seconds, I was able to raise the oven temperature by 10 degrees Fahrenheit. With new purpose, I set out to build a bike generator as quickly as possible. After a bit of trial and error, I strapped a DC motor from a Razor scooter to a mini workout bike I found at a thrift store, machined a hub adapter for the chain ring, and started pedaling. This worked too well. That's 200 degrees, 200 degrees in 15 minutes. The tiny potato chamber heated up quickly, so I decided to return the oven to its original chamber size. I was gonna go big. The larger potato takes much longer to cook than the tiny one. But how long would that be? I needed to find the perfect time and temperature. But what if it was too much work? I was disappointed to find a half-cooked potato after 45 minutes of pedaling and reaching 250 degrees Fahrenheit. My next test took forever to heat up as I began to realize the heating coil was short-circuiting. So I built a new coil, but during that test, I realized that the pedal was having issues. Pretty sure that this thing is cross-threaded. I'm starting to think that there are forces beyond me. I do not want this potato to be cooked. Maybe it's the Swedes. 
that's just the voltmeter. After fixing the bike and pedaling 75 minutes, reaching 275 degrees Fahrenheit, and a total of over three hours of pedaling that day, I opened what I Ooh. hoped would be a fully cooked potato. Oh, wow. That is cooked potato. That's good. That's actually good. That's how you cook a potato with your feet. Take that, Swedes. When I arrived at Slapsgiving, Lewis loved the potato cooking system. Four layers of yeah. 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 I don't think I've ever seen more insulation. In a it was horrible. Okay, okay. Potatoes produce Here's the question. nothing. Here's wow, this is... Here, watch what happens when I disconnect. You ready? Yeah. What? Oh, whoa! Whoa, science! Can I get into art? That's happening. And the great thing about being at a party is that I could get random people to do some of the pedaling for me. A lot more resistance, okay? This thing up to like 11. I even brought my pocket toaster, which was also a smash. Uh, really good! Here, here we go. That's pretty toasty. Right? That's pretty good. I was pretty impressed. Especially for a pocket toaster. Right. Is this a commercial product or is this made? I built this. You built this? I this potato cooked for longer and hotter than any other head. And it was now finally time to see what a communally peddled potato tasted like. Oh, that is a tender potato. Wow, good looking. Ooh. Oh, that does look good. That is, I mean, it tastes like right. a normal potato. Yeah, yeah that's, that's pretty cool. cool. That's, that's a great tasty. potato. It tastes like a soggy did french fry. <laughs> <laughs> and what did our gracious host, Lewis, think? Hmm. And when it's pretty good. It's definitely a potato. It is definitely the perfect oh. level of tender. Yes. And maybe a better question is, would you eat a pedal powered potato? Let me know in the comments. So yes, with about 10 grand, you could probably cook a potato with potatoes, but I'd save the money because you just might be potato enough to do it yourself. This video has no sponsor, but comments, likes, shares, and subscriptions go a long way. And if you wanna help further, I do have a Patreon and a PayPal in the links below. Thank you to everyone who made this possible. And be sure to go check out the other amazing Slapsgiving videos. Happy Thanksgiving, I'll see you next time.